Catherine Susan Pritchard, Nee Throssell, was a key figure in Australian literary history. Although Lawrence was not aware of the three novels she'd written when they corresponded on the 3rd of July. She was also a founding member of the Communist Party in Australia, created in 1920, earning her the disparaging nickname of the Red Witch. Married to Hugo Throssell, a war hero awarded the Victoria Cross at Gallipoli, she proudly shared a newspaper clipping detailing the birth of their son Rick. Lawrence observed, You are up and about wearing your little VC like a medal at your breast. Rick would also grow to become a writer as well as a diplomat, but his life would be marred by an unproven allegation that he was a Russian spy. Lawrence confides to Pritchard that there's plenty to love about Australia, and the fact he stayed for three months in one place isn't so bad. But it's a place he can never truly grasp, as I feel I slither on the edge of a gulf, reaching to grasp its atmosphere and spirit. It eludes me, and always would. Once more, he compares it to a previously Chavonet's painting, specifically winter. But of most interest is Pritchard's rural life in Greenmount. What do you grow on your land? My wife wants a little farm more than anything else. But how should I sit still so long? He uses painting as a metaphor to Kotelianski to describe the peculiar impact Australia has had on him. It is rather like falling out of a picture and finding oneself on the floor with all the gods and men left behind in the picture. Robert Mountsier is reminded twice in one paragraph that I am now expecting your cable with the money, as he is only able to get to the Tahiti if your cable money arrives, and that when he arrives in America, we will really sit still and spend nothing. But Lawrence is also aware of the depressing accounts of sales, with Sea and Sardinia selling 685 copies and Aaron's Rod 3,000 copies. Though he is keen to emphasise that this has nothing to do with Thomas Seltzer, who may be dodgy, but I believe he does his best. Seltzer was Lawrence's literary agent and helped bring him to an American audience, publishing his work between 1920 to 1923. Fighting censorship in the courts would eventually see his publishing company go bankrupt. Lawrence reassures Mountsier that he only has two chapters left to complete on Kangaroo and already his mind is focusing on the next location for inspiration. I should like, if I could, to write a New Mexico novel with Indians in it. No wonder he is so averse to sitting still. His novels are born of perpetual momentum. It's for this reason he must never get too settled. Thus, he confesses to Kotulensky, if I stayed here for six months, I should have to stay here forever. Mabel Dodge Stern is updated with his desired living requests. I wish we could settle down at or near Taos and have a little place of our own and a horse to ride. I do wish it might be like that. Reading Lawrence's letters, you can't help but admire his incredible attention to detail. He is constantly wheeling, dealing and instructing. Robert Mountsier is informed that Kangaroo will be sent by the Makora on the 20th of July and that he should have it typed up ready for him when he arrives in America so that he can go through it again. In a letter to Mountsier on the 17th of July, he inquires about a train strike in the USA which ran from the 2nd of July to the 14th of September and predicts you will have bad labour troubles in the next few years, amounting almost to revolution. Seems not much has changed in 100 years. But Lawrence isn't one for democratic solidarity, not when the unrest helps articulate his own frustrations with the public who have committed the cardinal sin of not buying enough of his books. The public that now is would never like me anymore, and I like it, and I hate it.
Republic, the monster with a million worm-like heads. He strikes a karma tone with the Brewsters, his Buddhist friends. Aisha is informed that the name of their property in Thorell was an Australian humorism, why work? And that Frieda has finished a Buddha embroidery and has now moved on to a vase of flowers. It sounds like domestic bliss. But these were difficult times. He was aware that he would arrive in Taos penniless and that this was all too familiar. But this would not stop him embracing a new experience and adding another language to his repertoire. I am now going to start learning Spanish, ready for the Mexicans. When he arrives in America, he will have time to read this famous Ulysses. James Joyce's modernist masterpiece had been published in Paris in February 1922 by Sylvia Beach of Shakespeare and Company and was receiving rave reviews. But Lawrence suspects his own novel, Kangaroo, will not receive the same adulation. If anything, even the Ulysseans will spit at it. 